actually too happy to introduce Simon Stiebelener here. He's uh, working as a data scientist for Craftworks, and he also is a lecturer at university, which is cool. And I think extra credit for that. So thank you for teaching the next people. Uh, he's going to talk about augmented intelligence, and that basically means like, how do we get to full automation, and when can we say that computers should not make the decision anymore, but the human is necessary, and how can we teach the computer the next time that what the human needed? So when it comes to the ethics of decisions, when it comes to the emotions of decisions, how do we get to full automation, and how do we get intelligence into machines that is much more human and not dangerous at the same time? So without many more ado, Simon, please. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to this talk about augmented intelligence, a human-machine marriage on the way to complete intelligent automation. Yeah, my name is Simon Stiebelena. As you already know, I'm data scientist at Craftworks and also lecturer at WU Wien and FH Wien. Before we dive straight into the actual topic of this talk, let me just lose a few words about what we actually do at Craftworks, since I, I guess most of you are not aware what we are. So we are a software and artificial intelligence company based right in the heart of Vienna. We develop individual custom artificial intelligence solutions and the software around it. Um, our big focus is on industrial artificial intelligence, and that's also where most of our customers come from, ranging from the automotive sector all the way to the energy sector and pretty much everything in between. The work with our clients is also the primary motivational factor in the topic of this talk, augmented intelligence. Before we get to augmented intelligence itself, though, we need to have a look at the current state of artificial intelligence. We will see that current AI technologies do have some significant weaknesses, and I will point out how taking an augmented intelligence approach can help us overcome these weaknesses. Finally, we will look into an industry case that should give you a bit of an idea of what, what an augmented intelligence system can actually look like. But first, let's go back to artificial intelligence. I'm sure that most of you at some point have Googled the term artificial intelligence, right? Who hasn't? And well, if you have done so, and perhaps you've even done an image search, well, then you will probably have seen images such as that, humanoid robots doing strange things. And if you then scrolled a bit further down in the search results, well, these images get creepier and creepier, actually. You see robots taking over the world, killing mankind, and so on. If you then still haven't had enough and you keep on scrolling, I promise at some point, and this really is unavoidable, you will find Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator as well. Right? And I can tell you one thing, this is not the current state of AI, luckily. What we've seen here are illusions. Right? And there is this famous saying by Hermann Wuck, fiction author and Pulitzer Prize winner. He once said, illusion is an anodyne bred by the gap between wish and reality. So we've seen illusions, but this now raises the question, what is reality? At what state are we in the development of artificial intelligence? It turns out that the current state is quite promising. Right? When you think of all the popular voice assistants, such as Siri, Cortana from Microsoft, or Alexa, they have become incredibly good at understanding human language just in the last couple of years. Similar progress has been made in computer vision. We are able to segment highly complex images into all of its parts. And we are even able to generate text that describes what's happening in an image just based on that image. Right? That's quite fascinating. That's quite amazing. And all that progress, well, that has ignited a spark of trust in us. Right? We are, this spark of trust in artificial intelligence makes us get into Teslas, drive around with the autopilot, and sooner or later, this spark will grow larger, will grow brighter, and it will get us into Google driverless cars. And we will basically be putting our, he our health, our life, into the hands of artificial intelligence at some point. However, our trust is limited. In 2016, Volvo conducted a study to find out what people actually expect from self-driving cars. And it turns out, quite ironically, that people really expect to have a steering wheel in self-driving cars. That sounds strange at first, true, but it is quite natural, because humans want to be able to take control over the system in case anything goes wrong, right? So it is quite understandable. Well, let's see 
how limited your trust in artificial intelligence is, or how unlimited. This could be a typical doctor's appointment in a bit more than 20 years, let's say 2040. So you go to your doctor, and your doctor is not a human anymore, but it's actually a computer, and that computer asks you, please tell me your symptoms and perhaps give me an x-ray image, and I will tell you which disease you have, or if you're healthy, hopefully. So that's what you do. You go to that doctor and you tell it, well, I have some chest pain, I have a bit of a cough, and here is an x-ray image of my chest. Please tell me, what do I have? The doctor, you know, the computer, takes five seconds to calculate because there's some machine learning, some deep, some deep learning model behind it. And it, out, it says, well, the good news is there's a 95% chance that you're healthy. But, well, the bad news is there is also a 5% chance that you have pneumonia. But, come on, it's only 5%. Probability threshold for, pneum for pneumonia infection is not reached. You are healthy. Congratulations. Go home. Enjoy life. And I ask you, well, does this really convince you? I mean, 5% is not a lot, right? But it is 5%. And when it's about health, 5% is a lot. So does, do you trust in the decision of artificial intelligence? Or do you perhaps prefer an additional human actually look over what that AI system predicted, what it outputted? Most of you, including me, I guess, would prefer having that additional human look over what the AI system actually did, because, you know, it's about our health, and this is perhaps the most precious thing that we have. Of course, you want a second opinion. But this does not only apply when it comes to health. This also applies in, different, in a different context. So the next example is from a context that we at Craftworks are highly familiar with, that we have big experience in, namely the industry. Imagine you're the manager of a production line. This is your production line. And as the manager, you know that sometimes you have to stop that production line to do maintenance, and that costs you around 10,000 euros because you know you cannot produce anything while the, while the production line is stopped and so on. But also sometimes, rarely but it does happen, there is a machine defect. And that is, that is quite expensive because you need to stop the production line for longer, you need to search the defect, the machine might be significantly damaged, and even the products you're producing might be damaged. And this is a so-called fault stop, so that is quite expensive then. What you want to do as the manager is, of course, minimize the occurrence of these costly fault stops. And you want to do that by installing a predictive maintenance solution. So an AI system that takes, for example, machine sensor data, and based on that machine sensor data predicts the probability of a machine defect in the next 24 hours. The machine sensor data could be temperature, pressure, or vibration, for example. Again, when you look at this, there is only a 10% chance of a machine defect happening in the next 24 hours. But 10% is still, is still a lot, because you might be facing 200,000 euros of costs if you actually miss that. And your AI system, well, is calibrated, a human calibrated AI system, it tells you, you know, do not worry, it's only 10%. Everything is okay, most probably, right? And again, even in this industrial context, the question arises, do I trust in the decision of my AI system? Or maybe, maybe I ask one of my workers at the production line to spend five minutes or maybe half an hour check if that really makes sense, what that system predicts. That could, that maybe takes you a couple of minutes, but it could really save you a lot of money. So all these examples we have seen are ranging from uh, the healthcare sector to the industrial sector. They highlight that our trust in artificial intelligence does have limitations. And this means that in near future, in the next one, two, maybe five years, we will not see these critical cases where it's about our health, or where it's about large monetary values. We will not see these cases completely automated by artificial intelligence, most likely. And there are good reasons for that. First, while well, current AI systems, they do have significant weaknesses. AI systems are usually based on machine learning models these days, on deep learning models, perhaps on statistical modeling or rule-based models. And the key word in all of that is model. And the model, per definition, only incorporates a very small fraction of the real world. And what it really incorporates, that small fraction, is determined by a human that specifies the model, and it's determined by the data that is actually available. So if you don't have data for something, well, you cannot model it. And if your human does some error, well, your model is going to be faulty. 
So there are significant limitations. And second, yet we do lack understanding of many deep learning and machine learning models. And not understanding in the sense of how the algorithm works. We do know how that works. But understanding when it comes to the reasoning, understanding why our model predicts what it predicts. And this especially applies to deep learning, where we are dealing with models with tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of parameters. These are just not possible to understand out of the box, right? Well, and this is where augmented intelligence comes into play. Augmented intelligence is a, well, a design approach to developing an artificial intelligence system. It's a collaborative approach with a different objective than you would typically design artificial intelligence system for. Augmented intelligence focuses on improving the decision-making abilities of humans. So you use artificial intelligence not to completely intelligently automate something in the first place, but you build them to support humans, to empower humans, to make their work more effective, more efficient, and ultimately build better results. So how could such an augmented intelligence approach look like in our production line case that we saw? Remember, this was the production line. Uh, you are the manager. Uh, there are maintenance stops and costly fault stops, right? And your predictive maintenance system outputs the probability of a machine fault happening in the next 24 hours. So if you take an augmented intelligence approach, this does look a bit different. In the beginning, it's pretty much the same. Again, you have your production line. It produces sensor data, temperature, vibration, and pressure. And that goes into your artificial intelligence model that is you know, kind of locked in because it only incorporates the sensor data. And that model predicts the probability of a machine fault in the next 24 hours. Now this probability is quite large. It's 70%. So you as the manager, if you see that, you will probably immediately stop that production line and do anything that's possible to avoid paying these 200,000 euros for that costly fault stop for a machine defect, right? Well, this is not the case if you take an augmented inte uh, intelligence approach, because you look beyond the prediction, then you go one step further, right? So you do not only output the prediction, but you also provide an explanation. So your system now says, well, the probability of a machine fault is 70% because there was a spike in vibration level today morning. And this is the point where an alarm goes off. One of your workers gets a notification on his mobile phone, and he sees exactly that information. He sees, all right, the predictive maintenance system says there's going to be a machine defect because there was a spike in vibration. And the good thing is, well, this worker, he's human. He is not limited. He is not bound to a model specification per se. So he knows, he, he knows that, well, today morning, there was construction work going on next to the machines, and that caused the vibrations. The vibrations are not coming from inside the machine, from some loose part or anything. So everything is fine. This spike in vibration level is no indication of a machine fault, right? And that costs your worker maybe two minutes, maybe five minutes. But it saves you 10,000 euros because you just avoided an unnecessary maintenance stop. So it does pay off quite quickly. Well, it turns out that augmented intelligence, as you've just seen, is it's a collaboration. It's a collaboration between artificial intelligence, machines, and humans. And in that collaboration, in that human-machine marriage, you could say, both parts do what they can do best. Artificial intelligence systems based on machine learning, and they excel at finding patterns in data, right? They're really good at that. But they are not really flexible, you know? If, if something is outside of the scope of the model, they cannot account for it. On the other hand, you have humans. Humans are really bad at finding patterns in high-dimensional data. Like, as soon as it's more than two, three, maybe four dimensions, we are really bad at that. But what we are good at is our flexibility. We are not limited by model specification. We can think outside of the box, right? And this makes augmented intelligence strong. You have a collaboration where both parts bring in their strengths. Augmented intelligence is an intermediate step, though. It's no, no final thing. Namely, it's one step ahead of using poor, uh, pure human intelligence. But it is only an intermediate step towards in our development towards complete intelligent automation using artificial intelligence. 
Well, despite the fact that it is an intermediate step, it is not a compromise, though. It is not a compromise. It is, in contrary, it is an indispensable, highly important step in our development towards complete intelligent automation. We need this stage of augmented intelligence to achieve complete intelligence auto intelligent automation at some point. Well, why is that so? First, of course, augmented intelligence, but all, by also including human intelligence in the decision-making process, helps us overcome these limitations of the boxed-in AI system that is solely, well, that is restricted by the data and by the human specification of the model. Of course, but most importantly, most importantly, by taking an augmented intelligence approach, we build trust in artificial intelligence technologies. At the very center of augmented intelligence is building understanding, making humans understand why models predict what they predict. And by building this understanding, we build trust. And so this, this trust is the foundation for the future large-scale adoption of artificial intelligence systems. This trust paves the way for complete intelligent automation, even for critical cases in future. Right? So I said that understanding is key when it comes to augmented intelligence. And in order to build understanding, um, communication is highly important. And this communication, well, that really used to be incredibly difficult in the past. How do you want a human and a black, how should a human and a black box communicate? Luckily, in uh, the field of explainable artificial intelligence has basically exploded in the last couple of years. There's a lot of research going into that field that is concerned with um, developing techniques that allow us to understand even black box models, to understand the reasoning of black box models. A couple of techniques are listed here, for example, lime shap or attention mechanisms, and there are many more. I will not go into the very depth of explainable AI because a fellow speaker, Ahmad, held a great talk yesterday on that. So yeah, I can recommend you to watch it on YouTube when it goes online. But what I will do is I will pick out one of my one technique that I'm a big fan of, namely SHAP. So what you can see here is a minimum Python code example of how you can use SHAP. SHAP is not only scientifically well founded, it's developed by the University of Washington, but it also comes with a very neat Python package, and that makes it easy to use and very powerful for practitioners as well. So here you can see that essentially in a couple of lines of code where I just load a data set, where I fit a simple model, and I use SHAP to explain my predictions, I get this nice graph down here, this so-called force plot. And this force plot visualizes the reasoning of my model, essentially. So we see our model output a value of 20.92. This is the value of a house, because our model was trained to predict the value of a house based on certain properties of that house, such as the number of rooms or the air, pollu air pollution in the area of the house. The red arrows are variables that push the value of our house upwards, that have a positive effect on it, such as a low air pollution. On the other hand, the blue arrows are variables that, that make our house be worth less. For example, our house is quite small, we only have a few rooms, and this has a, a large negative impact on the value of our house. That's why this blue arrow where it says rooms is relatively large. So the next time somebody asks you, why does your model predict what it predicts, you can actually exactly tell him why it does that. If you want to dive a bit deeper into SHAP, I prepared a small Jupyter notebook, which is a, a notebook like Python IDE that guides you through two examples of how to use SHAP, one tabular example and one example on images. Um, it's hosted on our Craftworks GitHub account, so feel free to check it out and play around with it. Furthermore, I can also really recommend to read into the actual paper of SHAP that was published at NIPS, and also check out the GitHub repository of SHAP. There are very good resources there as well. So we have seen a lot of theory now coming all the way from the current state of artificial intelligence to its weaknesses and to how augmented intelligence can help us overcome these weaknesses. Yet we still haven't seen how such an artificial intelligence system that was developed following an augmented intelligence approach can look like, though. Luckily, quite recently, um, we at Craftworks participated in an, in an Industry 4.0 hackathon organized by Pioneers. So we had 36 hours time to develop a prototype for Amoeba. Amoeba is a, 
a large Austrian company that produces industrial parts, many of them for the automotive sector. I guess quite, uh, quite a few of you will know the company. So Miba, among many other things, produces this kind of metal disc. This is just a rough drawing, right? And on this metal disc, there are like small patches glued onto it. And in the very most of the cases, these discs are totally OK. They are fine. But it can happen that there are certain defects. You know, it's th that's always the case in industrial processes. So here you have three different types of defect. Let's call them A, B, and C. What Miba does, well, of course, you want to find these defects before it leaves the production. So they use visual inspection. They take two different kinds of images. On the right part, you see a brightness image. On the left part, you see a depth image. On each of these images, you can see the front and the back side of the disk stretched out, right? And in these images, theoretically, you can find defects. But they are incredibly hard to find, because the defects can be very, very subtle. The images can be a bit noisy. So it's really not trivial, even for a human that knows what he's looking for. It can even take you a couple of minutes finding a defect in these images. Our goal was to build a self-learning system, so a deep learning or machine learning based system that actually classifies these images into OK or defect, and furthermore also classifies them into the exact type of defect if there is a defect. Well, since I promised that we took an augmented intelligence approach, we of course also looked beyond the prediction. We went one step further, namely, we built also, we want to equip the user with, with inspection capabilities that allow him to see why our model predicts what it predicts. So he should be provided with model explanations that help him finding, discovering defects. And finally, of course, we want to make a dialogue. We want to ensure a dialogue between machine and human. So we also want the user to be able to provide us feedback. So if, if we fail to, def to detect the defect, the user can always mark something and provide feedback to our model so it keeps continuously learning. What we got from Miba was data, of course. So there, was, there were 12,000 unlabeled images, of which we knew that the vast majority of them are actually OK. There are no defects in them. And then we got 520, around 520 labeled images. And these labeled images came in, three, in four different classes, three of them defect types and one OK class. So if you are familiar with machine learning modeling, right, you can already see a couple of challenges here. First, well, you do have only very few labeled images. This is not a lot labeled images for the, for the defects being so subtle. So you cannot just you know, throw a deep convolutional neural network at it and hope that it works out. That won't work out very well with that limited number of images with the highly imbalanced class frequencies and with these very subtle defects. So we took an unsupervised approach first. We used the unlabeled data to build uh, an autoencoder, deep convolutional autoencoder, that essentially is two deep convolutional neural networks plugged together. On the one side, so what this algorithm does, on the one side, it takes an image, and then it compresses it and compresses it, throwing away all the unimportant information until you end up with this very small black box here in the middle, this latent space representation. Then on the right side of the autoencoder, the so-called decoder, takes that very small black box, that latent space representation, and upsamples it again. It makes it bigger to reconstruct the original image. So ideally, your input and output image would look the same. However, since you reduce the amount of information so much by compressing it, you always lose information. And that's why there is always a bit of a difference between your input and output image, which is called reconstruction error. So in practice, it kind of looked like that. On the one hand, uh, we used as inputs our two images per sample laid on top of each other. On the right hand, we reproduced them. The difference was the reconstruction error. That's what you can see here on top. So this reconstruction error, you can see that there are red and yellowish areas in that reconstruction error image. And these are the areas that our autoencoder failed to reconstruct properly. So there, there is a large error. And this is actually good, because autoencoders have the nice property that they only learn what they've seen very, very, very often. And since we know that in our unlabeled data, well, there are no defect parts, our autoencoder just doesn't know how to reconstruct defect areas. So what this shows us, where there is large reconstruction error, there is likely a defect or at least some anomaly that is not normal. 
And we can use this, overlay it with the original image, and actually get a quite nice, quite easy visualization for the reasoning of our model. So the red and yellow areas you see here, that's where our model thinks that there are defects, there are anomalies, right? So when a user now looks at that, he can find defects in a matter of seconds where it probably took him minutes before if it was a subtle defect. At this point, we haven't classified anything yet, though, right? So in the next step, we took that autoencoder and our labeled data. We had 520 labeled images. Our autoencoder was pre-trained on the unlabeled data, to remember you. We used the labeled data's input for autoencoder and extracted, on the one hand, the, this latent space representation in the middle, which is this highly condensed representation of the image, which can be as small as 1% or even less of the, of the original image. And we took our reconstruction error from the autoencoder, concatenated them to a feature vector, and trained a robust classifier based on that feature vector and our labels to predict the exact type of defect and whether there is a defect or, or whether it's OK. And that actually worked out very, very, very well. And since I promised that we, well, a big part of an augmented intelligence approach is this human machine interface, right? And that's why we also created a small web application that allows a user to see our prediction. He is able to inspect the images, he is able to zoom in, zoom out. Uh, he sees where our autoencoder highlighted that defects are, and he can even draw bounding boxes to actually really provide us with feedback to label our data in case we missed something. So as you see, the big advantages from taking an augmented intelligence approach, from designing such a system for a dialogue between uh, humans and artificial intelligence, are first that we do overcome existing limitations when it's about edge cases, right? When our model is uncertain, then we can, a human can always jump in and help us. And that, when a human jumps in, flows straight back into the model, and our model keeps on learning. Second, we foster understanding. We provide the user with an exact visualization of why our model thinks of where defects are. And the user can not only, well, build understanding based on that and trust, but he can also he can also now find defects a lot faster, right? So there are significant benefits and actually not too much more work in designing such a system following an augmented intelligence approach by uh, designing such a system for collaboration. Well, we have come a long way now. We went all the way from the current state of artificial intelligence to its weaknesses, on the one hand, limitations due to, due to the fact that it's based on models and available data. We saw how augmented intelligence can actually help you overcome these weaknesses by taking a human-centered approach, by taking a collaborative approach. And we also saw what role explainable AI plays in, in um, augmented intelligence, namely a very important one. It provides us with a set of techniques to even demystify the black box models. And finally, uh, you saw an industry case that hopefully gave you a bit of an idea of what is important when designing such an augmented intelligence system. Last but not least, I want to encourage you that if you are building artificial intelligence systems and for some reason you cannot or do not want to automate something completely, also think about how can I design that system to make humans' life easier? How can I empower humans to make their work more efficient, more effective, and take the pain out of their work? I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Feel free to reach out to me via LinkedIn or email. I'm always happy to hear from you. And visit our website, craftworks.at. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Excellent work. Uh, quite some good feedback. You actually have people praising you, so you should get the <laughs> list from the Slido people to answer all the questions that you couldn't answer. Sure. And they have your email already for the first time. They don't have to ask you for an email, so that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, first question, if everybody is like, well, are the slides available? So I think we should oh, make yeah. that as develop uh, as... Yes. Um, the slides also, I will post the slides in the um, GitHub repo link. So I showed it before. When you just search for Craftworks GitHub, then you will find our GitHub um, account, and then the slides will be there. Um, in the house prediction example, mm -hmm. how do you decide if a parameter raises or lowers the house price? Maybe a buyer prefers low social class, older houses. Sorry? Just maybe, maybe people are okay with a, with, a, mm -hmm. with a bad neighborhood or with a lower yeah. price. Um, so basically, 
this, this model was trained on a very famous data set, the so-called Boston Housing data set, that was collected by some uh, US university back in the 70s, right? And typically, well, what, what you train your model on in that data set is typically to predict the value of a house based on certain properties. So even your personal preference doesn't really influence the prediction. This, your, your house might be worth more to you than it was historically, than what is reflected in the data, right? So your personal preference, of course, is not um, taking account for um, in that prediction, in that data set even. Cool. One last one. Um, what do you think, what would you add to the three laws of robotics by Asimov? Sorry? The three laws of robotics by Isaac Asimov, what would you add to them? Pooh, that's a good question. Um, so I, I would probably add to make an exception for the Terminator because he was played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, and yeah, I'm a big fan of him, so he should not go into yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's not talk about the logic of the Terminator because he's only he's only there because he sent his own maker back in time to. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, yeah. well, thank you very much. Um, lots of questions. Please answer them. Yeah, sure. People have good questions here. and great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.